Chapter Seven of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Eight, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Seven. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address By the retreat of Lee from Gettysburg, and the immediate pursuit by Meade, the burial of the dead and care of the wounded on that great battlefield, were left largely to the military and local authorities of the state of Pennsylvania. Governor Andrew G. Curtin gave the humane and patriotic duty his thoughtful attention and during its execution the appropriate design of changing a portion of the field into a permanent cemetery where the remains of the fallen heroes might be brought together and their last resting place suitably protected and embellished was conceived and begun the citizen soldiery from seventeen of the loyal states had taken part in the conflict on the union side and the several governors of these states heartily cooperated in the project which thus acquired a national character. This circumstance made it natural that the dedication ceremonies should be of more than usual interest and impressiveness. Accordingly, at the beginning of November 1863, when the work was approaching its completion, Mr. David Wills, the special agent of Governor Curtin, and also acting for the several states, who had not only originated but mainly superintended the enterprise wrote the following letter of invitation to president lincoln quote, the several states having soldiers in the army of the potomac who were killed at the battle of gettysburg or have since died at the various hospitals which were established in the vicinity have procured grounds on a prominent part of the battlefield for a cemetery and are having the dead removed to them and properly buried these grounds will be consecrated and set apart to this sacred purpose by appropriate ceremonies on thursday the nineteenth instant honorable edward everett will deliver the oration i am authorized by the governors of the different states to invite you to be present and participate in these ceremonies which will doubtless be very imposing and solemnly impressive it is the desire that after the oration you as chief executive of the nation formally set apart these grounds to their sacred use by a few appropriate remarks it will be a source of great gratification to the many widows and orphans that have been made almost friendless by the great battle here to have you here personally and it will kindle anew in the breasts of the comrades of these brave dead who are now in the tented field or nobly meeting the foe in the front, a confidence that they who sleep in death on the battlefield are not forgotten by those highest in authority. And they will feel that, should their fate be the same, their remains will not be uncared for. We hope you will be able to be present to perform this last solemn act to the soldier dead on this battlefield. Unquote. President Lincoln expressed his willingness to perform the duty requested of him. On the day preceding the ceremonies, he went by special train to Gettysburg, accompanied by the Secretary of State and other prominent persons. The village was full of visitors when they arrived. That evening, in response to a serenade, Mr. Seward made a short address, in the course of which he said, I thank my God that I believe this strife is going to end in the removal of that evil which ought to have been removed by deliberate counsels and peaceful means. And I thank him for the hope that when this cause is removed, simply by the operation of abolishing it, as the origin and agent of that treason that is without justification and without parallel, we shall thenceforth be united be only one country having only one hope one ambition and one destiny when we part tomorrow night let us remember 
that we owe it to our country and to mankind that this war shall have for its conclusion the establishing of the principle of democratic government the simple principle that whatever party whatever portion of the community prevails by constitutional suffrage in an election that party is to be respected and maintained in power until it shall give place on another trial and another verdict to a different portion of the people if you do not do this you are drifting at once and irresistibly to the very verge of universal cheerless and hopeless anarchy but with that principle this government of ours the purest the best the wisest and the happiest in the world must be and so far as we are concerned practically will be immortal at the appointed hour on the nineteenth a vast procession with military music moved to the cemetery grounds where in the midst of a distinguished auditory the orator of the day edward everett made an address worthy alike of his own fame and the extraordinary occasion his discourse occupied itself with three principal and natural divisions of his subject the great battle the origin and character of the war and the object and consequences of victory it is not too much to say that for the space of two hours he held his listeners spellbound by the rare power of his art the durable interest of history in his utterance lies most in the witness he bore concerning the character and responsibility of those who began the great conflict of which this battle was one of the principal events if there was an american who was qualified by moral training by literary culture by political study by official experience by party affiliation by long practice in historical criticism and ripe experience in public utterance to sit in calm judicial inquiry on the causes theories and possible results of the civil war that man was edward everett furnished under the most favorable auspices during his student years with the full panoply of scholastic acquirements that teachers and textbooks can provide beginning his career as a minister of the gospel under the rigid self-restraints and tempering charity which that calling imposes he passed successively to the duties of a college professor where out of the critical study of the value of words grew the rare perfection of his literary style then by a ten years participation in national legislation as a member of the lower house of congress he became familiar with the quality of laws and the ends of government following this his functions as governor of massachusetts gave him practical insight into the principles and needs of local administration the authority of the executive as the guardian of the liberties of the citizen sent abroad thereafter to fill the highest diplomatic office of the american government as minister to england he was called upon under broad principles of the law of nations to discuss and adjust several difficult and far-reaching questions which touched not merely the present but also the future welfare and greatness of his country later he was appointed to the wider and more responsible duties of secretary of state during the close of fillmore's administration when the whole diplomatic service of the american government was entrusted to his care and direction crowning his official career he was elected to the united states senate where the opening phases of the great slavery agitation engaged his earnest solicitude and temperate comment his impaired health withdrew him from politics and enabled him to stand aloof from party heats and factional storms this circumstance placed him in that neutral attitude in virtue of which he became the nominee for vice president of the constitutional union party in 1860 which professed to ignore the slavery issue and to stand as a peace compelling umpire between the extremists of the north and the south where then could be found an observer 
critic or commentator of nicer skill of finer judgment of more impartial temper in the clamor and conflict of assertion and denial of crimination and recrimination the words of such a man uttered on such an occasion as this dedication of the gettysburg cemetery in the presence of these august living witnesses standing amidst the half-closed graves of the greatest battlefield of the war become a testimony and a guide to the historian and to posterity before which flimsy excuse and selfish appeal choleric invective and maudlin sympathy alike fade into insignificance it must be remembered that his were not the hasty expressions of excitement or passion that marked the culmination of controversy and the outbreak of hostilities this was near the close of the third year of the war when every claim had been heard every protest weighed every profession tested by the criterion of practical experiment neither was it the mere fervid outburst of an orator's heat his indictment embodies the calm reflection of the thinker in his study pronounced with the grave authority of the statesman on his tribune only a few of its salient paragraphs can here be quoted beginning his oration with a recital of the mortuary honors which the greeks paid the warriors who died in battle for the cause of their country and passing from that theme to quote, our obligations to the martyrs and surviving heroes of the army of the potomac unquote, the speaker went on with a master's skill to draw a picture of the great campaign in battle coming then to a new branch of his subject he continued quote, and now friends fellow citizens as we stand among these honored graves the momentous question presents itself which of the two parties to the war is responsible for all this suffering for this dreadful sacrifice of life the lawful and constitutional government of the united states or the ambitious men who have rebelled against it i call the war which the confederates are waging against the union a rebellion because it is one and in grave matters it is best to call things by their right names i speak of it as a crime because the constitution of the united states so regards it and puts rebellion on a par with invasion the constitution and law not only of england but of every civilized country regard them in the same light or rather they consider the rebel in arms as far worse than the alien enemy to levy war against the united states is the constitutional definition of treason and that crime is by every civilized government regarded as the highest which citizen or subject can commit not content with the sanctions of human justice of all the crimes against the law of the land it is singled out for the denunciations of religion the litanies of every church in christendom whose ritual embraces that office as far as i am aware from the metropolitan cathedrals of europe to the humblest missionary chapel in the islands of the sea concur with the church of england in imploring the sovereign of the universe by the most awful adjurations which the heart of man can conceive or his tongue utter to deliver us from sedition privy conspiracy and rebellion and reason good for while a rebellion against tyranny a rebellion designed after prostrating arbitrary power to establish free government on the basis of justice and truth is an enterprise on which good men and angels may look with complacency an unprovoked rebellion of ambitious men against a beneficent government for the purpose the avowed purpose of establishing extending and perpetuating any form of injustice and wrong is an imitation on earth of that first foul revolt of the infernal serpent against which the supreme majesty of heaven sent forth the armed myriads of his angels and clothed the right arm of his son with the three bolted thunders of omnipotence lord bacon in the true marshalling of the sovereign decrees of honor assigns the first place to 
the conditores imperiorum founders of states and commonwealths and far more than to any of those to whom bacon assigns this highest place of honor whose names can hardly be repeated without a wandering smile romulus cyrus caesar ottoman ishmael is it due to our washington as the founder of the american union but if to achieve or help to achieve this greatest work of man's wisdom and virtue gives title to a place among the chief benefactors rightful heirs of the benedictions of mankind by equal reason shall the bold bad men who seek to undo the noble work eversores imperiorum destroyers of states who for base and selfish ends rebel against beneficent governments seek to overturn wise constitutions to lay powerful republican unions at the foot of foreign thrones to bring on civil and foreign war anarchy at home dictation abroad desolation ruin by equal reason i say yes a thousandfold stronger shall they inherit the execrations of the ages but to hide the deformity of the crime under the cloak of that sophistry which strives to make the worse appear the better reason we are told by the leaders of the rebellion that in our complex system of government the separate states are sovereigns and that the central power is only an agency certainly i do not deny that the separate states are clothed with sovereign powers for the administration of local affairs it is one of the most beautiful features of our mixed system of government but it is equally true that in adopting the federal constitution the states abdicated by express renunciation all the most important functions of national sovereignty and by one comprehensive self-denying clause gave up all right to contravene the constitution of the united states specifically and by enumeration they renounced all the most important prerogatives of independent states for peace and for war the right to keep troops or ships of war in time of peace or to engage in war unless actually invaded to enter into compact with another state or a foreign power to lay any duty on tonnage or any impost on exports or imports without the consent of congress to enter into any treaty alliance or confederation to grant letters of mark and reprisal and to emit bills of credit while all these powers and many others are expressly vested in the general government to ascribe to political communities thus limited in their jurisdiction who cannot even establish a post office on their own soil the character of independent sovereignty and to reduce a national organization clothed with all the transcendent powers of government to the name and condition of an agency of the states proves nothing but that the logic of secession is on a par with its loyalty and patriotism oh but the reserved rights and what of the reserved rights the tenth amendment of the constitution supposed to provide for reserved rights is constantly misquoted by that amendment the powers not delegated to the united states by the constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people the powers reserved must of course be such as could have been but were not delegated to the united states could have been but were not prohibited to the states but to speak of the right of an individual state to secede as a power that could have been though it was not delegated to the united states is simple nonsense but waiving this obvious absurdity can it need a serious argument to prove that there can be no state right to enter into a new confederation reserved under a constitution which expressly prohibits a state to enter into any treaty alliance or confederation or any agreement or compact with another state or a foreign power 
to say that the state may by enacting the preliminary farce of secession acquire the right to do the prohibited things to say for instance that though the states in forming the constitution delegated to the united states and prohibited to themselves the power of declaring war there was by implication reserved to each state the right of seceding and then declaring war that though they expressly prohibited to the states and delegated to the united states the entire treaty-making power they reserved by implication for an express reservation is not pretended to the individual states to florida for instance the right to secede and then to make a treaty with spain retroceding that spanish colony and thus surrendering to a foreign power the key to the gulf of mexico to maintain propositions like these with whatever affected seriousness it is done appears to me egregious trifling pardon me my friends for dwelling on these wretched sophistries but it is these which conducted the armed hosts of rebellion to your doors on the terrible and glorious days of july and which have brought upon the whole land the scourge of an aggressive and wicked war room cannot be given in these pages to the speaker's consoling prediction fortified by numerous historical precedents that at last reunion must come and that reconciliation would surely follow a prediction which the same generation that fought the war has seen happily fulfilled after the lapse of a quarter of a century the american reader can without misgiving repeat the prophecy of the orator that quote, these bonds of union are of perennial force and energy while the causes of alienation are imaginary factitious and transient the heart of the people north and south is for the union unquote. mr everett ended in a brilliant peroration the echoes of which were lost in the long and hearty plaudits of the great multitude and then president lincoln arose to fill the part assigned him in the program it was a trying ordeal to fittingly crown with a few brief sentences the ceremonies of such a day and such an achievement in oratory finished erudite apparently exhaustive of the theme replete with all the strength of scholastic method and the highest graces of literary culture if there arose in the mind of any discriminating listener on the platform a passing doubt whether mr lincoln would or could properly honor the unique occasion that doubt vanished with his opening sentence for then and there the president pronounced an address of dedication so pertinent so brief yet so comprehensive so terse yet so eloquent linking the deeds of the present to the thoughts of the future with simple words in such living original yet exquisitely molded maxim like phrases that the best critics have awarded it an unquestioned rank as one of the world's masterpieces in rhetorical art he said fourscore and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure we are met on a great battlefield of that war we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this but in a larger sense we cannot dedicate we cannot concentrate we cannot hallow this ground the brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract the world will little note nor long remember what we say here 
but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. After the conclusion of the ceremonies, the President and his party, accompanied by the orator and his friends, returned to Washington that same evening by a special train. On the next day, Mr. Everett sent the President the following note. Quote, My dear sir, not wishing to intrude upon your privacy, when you must be so much engaged, I beg leave in this way to thank you very sincerely for your great thoughtfulness for my daughter's accommodation on the platform yesterday, and much kindness otherwise to me and mine at Gettysburg. Permit me also to express my great admiration of the thoughts expressed by you, with such eloquent simplicity and appropriateness, at the consecration of the cemetery. I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. My son, who parted from me at Baltimore, and my daughter concur in this sentiment. Unquote. To this courteous compliment, Mr. Lincoln replied on the same day, quote, Your kind note of today is received. In our respective parts yesterday, you could not have been excused to make a short address, nor I a long one. I am pleased to know that, in your judgment, the little I did say was not entirely a failure. Of course, I knew Mr. Everett would not fail, and yet, while the whole discourse was eminently satisfactory, and will be of great value, there were passages in it which transcended my expectations. The point made against the theory of the general government being only an agency, whose principles are the states, was new to me, and, as I think, is one of the best arguments for the national supremacy. The tribute to our noble women, for their angel ministering to the suffering soldiers, surpasses in its way, as do the subjects of it, whatever has gone before." Unquote. End of chapter 7. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois.